Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our new installment two of Critical Thinkers and Religion Law and Social Theory. As always, I would like to begin by thanking my co-organizers, Andre de Liberté, Pascal Cormier, Elke Winter, and Sonia Sika. Um, who else may oh, I know who else I need to thank? Uh, the Office of the Vice President of Research, Morgan Hunter, our information officer. Um, <laughs> Stephen Tomlins, our website administrator and video camera. I always have to look because I never know what we're going to call him this month because he wears many hats. <laughs> and Heather Shipley, who's the project manager for the Religion and Diversity Project. Um, today, it's my great pleasure to welcome a colleague and friend, James Beckford, who's agreed to come back. We keep dragging him back to Ottawa. Um, and this time, in the capacity as a critical thinker, lecturer and all of these nice things written down here about all of the books that he's uh, he's written and so on and so forth and I know that many of you have read his books and so I'm not going to go through the whole whole list of them I will mention one of my personal favorites social theory and religion and I've had the privilege of reading that yet again this week uh, with my graduate class and I know most of them I think if not all of them are here as well um, he spent the last, I think, two decades researching prisons, and he's presently involved in the Religion and Diversity Project with some of his Canadian colleagues doing a, pro a comparative project between uh, Britain and Wales and, the Can and Canada. And so we're very happy to have him here for all kinds of reasons. But I'd like to say that personally, I've always relied on Jim's work to sort of set me straight when I'm, when I'm uh, in, a, in a bind about a particular, especially theoretical matter. And last week, I had the privilege of hearing him speak uh, as the president of the Society for the Scientific Study of Religion in Milwaukee. He gave a wonderful presidential address on post-secularism. And so if you've been wondering about this strange post-secular word, you might also um, want to ask him questions about that as well. But today, his focus is religious freedom, religious diversity, and prisons. And so, Jim, thanks so much for coming, and will you join with me in welcoming you? Well, thank you very much, Laurie, and thanks to the organizers, too. Can I just check that you can hear me at the back? Is it switched on? Is it working? No. No. It should be working. Fine tune it. Oh, How are we doing now? You can hear me okay? You can hear me okay? Yeah. 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 We can hear you. You can hear me as well, right? Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and it's a great honor to be here, and particularly to be on this program uh, with so many other distinguished, very distinguished uh, contributors. Um, now, what I'm going to do today is to talk about this combination of things, religious freedom, religious diversity, and prison, which is not a combination of things. But let me begin by putting this in into the context of today, where we are now. So, um, journalists are usually quite quick to pick up on stories uh, that are anything to do with religious diversity, and particularly with the problems that, that go with that diversity. So, here's a case from Britain. This lady was a check-in um, clock at uh, British Airways in London, and uh, she wore that crucifix necklace that you can see at the bottom of the slide there. Um, it led to uh, a case, uh, an employment tribunal case, uh, which she lost. Um, and there was some consideration about whether to appeal and whether the uh, Equalities and Human Rights Commission in Britain might actually take up her case. So that was one case that attracted quite a lot of attention. And the blogosphere certainly came to light over her case. Another one concerned this couple, um, Pentecostals, uh, who wanted to foster children, children who were in care, but their application to foster children was rejected because they refused to accept homosexuality. They would not uh, agree that that was an acceptable uh, way of living. Um, and on the basis that they had thereby infringed the equality laws, the anti-discrimination laws in Britain, um, they were not allowed to foster children. France is only uh, 25 miles away from Britain at the closest, um, but 
sometimes it seems to be a world apart. Um, the French press is preoccupied by the controversial new religious movements, cults, as popularly called in the English language. And uh, this organization, Livilude, uh, is a French government agency. Um, it's a, an acronym, and, and the French means the Interministerial Mission for Vigilance and Struggle Against Cultic Aberrations. <laughs> That's lovely to do. And here you have Le Figaro, one of the Main Street papers, a conservative one, um, reporting uh, that Dividud in, it, in its uh, annual report uh, was denouncing, blowing the whistle on the dangers of millenarian groups for their followers. Um, and the year 2012, in case you're not aware, is likely to be a year of intense prophetic expectation. Livilu will, will be having a lot of business next year. Um, on the other hand, a lot of French journalists are preoccupied uh, with the uh, Wild et Terrain, and here you have something from the Parisien um, reporting on that. Uh, religious diversity as such is not a topic that figures much in the French press. They, they prefer to home in on their two favorite stories, uh, the cults and the veil. But Canada isn't uh, free from these interests either. So Canadian journalists have also given plenty of publicity to cases involving such things as religiously based objections to homosexuality and same-sex marriage, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses' practice of withholding blood transfusion from sick children, and the dismissal of a Canadian marriage camp commissioner for refusing to marry a same-sex couple. And they all got written up in, in Canadian papers. So uh, there is clearly some interest in the media in this topic of religious freedom and the problems that the journalists uh, discern in that topic. Now, what is striking, I find, about all these cases is that none of them directly concerns a straightforward issue of the freedom to believe something or to practice something. They're all slightly indirect uh, to that. And yet the, the freedom of religion as a, as a doctrine to them, uh, is concerned more often than not in the way that philosophers handle it uh, with the right to believe certain things. If only it were so simple. Of course, there have been cases in many parts of the world where there have been outright refusal, denials of the right to believe certain things, to practice certain things. One only has to think, for example, of the Soviet bloc countries for 50 years, Nazi Germany, Japan under fascism. They were all regimes that, in one way or another, categorically outlawed certain religious beliefs and practices. And even today, the practice of Falun Gong is still outlawed in China. But in Western Europe and North America today, it seems to me that issues of religious freedom are more likely to arise in connection with contested notions of equality, state neutrality towards religions, and with the practical implications that flow from holding particular beliefs and identities. In other words, what I'm driving at is that the freedom of religion more likely to be framed these days in legal terms, at least in the liberal democracies. It's no longer enough to talk merely of tolerance or toleration. Um, my co-researcher, Benjamin Berger, now at the Ottoman School of Law, he refers to this as the, the easy language of toleration. The easy language of toleration. But religious freedom nowadays concerns rights and liberties that have become enshrined in a variety of national and international charters, codes, statutes, covenants, constitutions. And in turn, all these different legal instruments are implemented by a whole host of lawyers, juries, courts, judges, at all levels of national systems of law, and in Europe, at the European level too. And many religious organizations now have their own codes of law, legal specialists, and even courts for regulating their own members' conduct. So what I'm thinking about here is the juridification of the freedom of religion. Um, it's a jargon term, but it means the ever-expanding scope of law and legal processes that's come to dominate discussions of religious freedom in recent decades. 
And at the same time, religious freedom continues to have political implications in many parts of the world. For example, it has been the policy of the United States since 1998 to monitor the state of religious freedom in every country of the world and to develop programs for promoting it. But that is not welcomed by all people. And here's a quote, first of all, from Robert Wuthner in 1981, some time ago, complaining that the very concept of freedom has been tarnished by the culture of modernity. Freedom of religion has ceased being the guarantor of ultimate values. It has become an ideology of modernity. That's one view. Another one, from a very different position, I think, is that from Winifred Sullivan. She wrote that the, uh, legally encompassing the religious ways of people in an intensely pluralist society is most likely impossible. And the title of one of her best known books is The Impossibility of Religious Freedom. It's a very provocative uh, argument, and I strongly recommend that you have a look at it. And she has developed it more recently in relation to prisons. Uh, so it's doubly relevant for me. Now these frameworks of law, legal cases, legal scholarship, they've grown up around notions of religious freedom. And they are complex, they are diverse, and they are changing. Nevertheless, it is clear, and here I'm going to quote Laurie Beeman, just to embarrass her. Uh, <laughs> understanding what it means to talk about religious freedom and its boundaries, has perhaps never been more critical in our society, particularly as we struggle with issues of diversity, identity, and multiculturalism. And I'm really following along in the wake of that sentiment and showing eventually that this has considerable relevance to prisons. The point of what I want to talk about today is that there are also variations in the practices whereby the freedom of religion is interpreted and implemented, not just in the doctrines of religious freedom, not just in the philosophical underpinning of the notion or the theological contributions to it, or the legal arguments about it. I'm talking about the practical implementation of rules and regulations in day-to-day -day life. In other words, I want to throw some light on those everyday social interactions through which religious freedom is claimed by some, constructed, enacted, negotiated, rejected, a whole host of everyday social interactions there. So I'm not just concerned about what goes on in the heads of philosophers or lawyers. I am concerned about everyday social interactions. And how are we going to do that? What I'm trying to do here is to frame a sociology of religious freedom. I didn't think that's been done before. Or at least, be more modest, and what I'm trying to do is to identify some of the components that would be part of a well-rounded sociological approach to understanding the social settings and the practices in which struggles over religious freedom occur. Now, my approach focuses largely on the experiences of people who are involved in claiming, contesting, managing religious diversity and the right to freedom of religion in institutional settings. I'm going to make my life easier by narrowing the focus in a number of respects, three in fact. I'm going to focus particularly on religious diversity and, and how religious diversity complicates the issues in some ways, and sharpens the issues in certain ways. Second, I'm going to limit my discussion to the setting of prisons. And third, I'm going to focus only on the prisons, only on the prisons of France. United States, Canada, and Britain. <laughs> but uh, when I say Britain, you'll be relieved to know I don't mean Scotland or Northern Ireland. I'm talking about England and Wales, I mean two of the four parts of the United Kingdom. But I'll say Britain because it's quicker. Well, why prisons? Isn't that perverse and that paradoxical? Talking about freedom in relation to prisons. Um, the very places where, where the deprivation of freedom is legally institutionalized. So it's an odd choice. But I'm in good company. Um, as some of you will know, I'm sure, uh, the, the great writer Dostoevsky and Winston Churchill, uh, the British States, both thought that the treatment of prisoners was a good indicator 
of the quality of a society.